five, four, three, two, one, zero. I'm Trevor Potter, president and founder of Campaign Legal Center. Thank you for joining us today. CLC is a national nonpartisan organization that works to advance democracy through law at the federal, state, and local levels. We fight for every American's right to participate in the democratic process. We work to protect and improve democracy. We believe our democracy should be transparent, accountable, and inclusive. In 2021, state legislatures around the country are considering and passing a record number of bills dealing with voting and elections. Many of these would have the effect and often the intention of making it harder and more complicated to vote for many citizens. In order to make the promise of democracy real for all of us, all voters must be able to cast their ballots for their candidates of choice, freely, safely, and equally. Today, our panel of experts and state advocates will discuss the trends in access to voting legislation and the impact the bills will have on voters. Specifically, what type of legislation could help make voting more safe and accessible for all of us? And what bills will create deliberate barriers to the freedom to vote? With that said, I now turn it over to our moderator for today, Jonathan Diaz of CLC, to introduce the members of the panel and start today's conversation. Jonathan. Thank you, Trevor, uh, and thank you to everyone who's joining us online for this live event. Uh, my name is Jonathan Diaz, and I am legal counsel for voting rights at CLC. Uh, before I introduce uh, today's panel, I would like to review a few housekeeping items um, for this afternoon's discussion. So first, uh, please use the comment section on Facebook or YouTube, wherever you're watching this event, uh, to submit questions for members of our panel. After we've heard from our panel members uh, and begun the discussion, we'll start the question and answer portion of today's event. Um, we'll do our best to get to every question, but because time is limited, we may not be able to answer every question. Um, so if we're not able to answer your question today during the live event, uh, if you're a member of the press, please email your questions to media at campaignlegal.org. And if you're a member of the public, please email your question to info at campaignlegal.org. Uh, so with that out of the way, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today's panel. First is Tori Dolan. Tori is the Native Vote Law Fellow at the Indian Legal Clinic, Arizona State University. She's a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, and she has dedicated her career to using her legal expertise to address the barriers that Native American tribes and tribal members face when voting around the country. Next is my colleague, Caleb Jackson, who is also a legal counsel for voting rights at CLC. Caleb spearheads our, our legislative and policy advocacy and assists with litigation pertaining to all of CLC's voting rights work. And last but not least, Nancy Leifer is the president of the League of Women Voters of Montana, where she works on a variety of issues related to voting rights and elections. Uh, so I wanna thank all of our panelists for joining us today for what I'm sure will be a very interesting and exciting conversation. Uh, so let's jump right in. Um, during the 2020 election cycle, a record number of Americans voted early in person or by mail, uh, in part due to the COVID-19 pandemic. More than 100 million ballots were cast prior to election day during the 2020 election cycle. But now, legislative proposals and measures in several states seek to make changes to both in-person early voting and absentee or vote by mail. Um, let's start with Tori. Can you tell me a little bit about what you saw in Arizona during the previous election cycle and what changes you anticipate or have been proposed to early in-person voting and vote by mail in the legislature this cycle? 
Yeah, um, thanks for having me, by the way. So the first statewide election in Arizona was a week after the pandemic was declared, in fact, a pandemic. And from there, there was a lot of concern about public health and a lot of emphasis on voting by mail or voting early in the upcoming elections. And um, voting by mail is incredibly popular in Arizona. Um, approximately 70 to 80% of the state votes by mail. But we saw a really loud increase in options on how you return your ballot through the expanded use of drop boxes, through the expanded availability of in-person early voting locations where you could also drop your ballot off. And in particular, we saw an increase in efforts to make those methods of voting early available for rural and tribal voters that have inconsistent or decreased access to mail because they live with non-standard addresses or they don't have at-home mail delivery. What we've seen in the legislature this session is to change the nature of voting by mail. One proposed bill um, requires some form of ID be included on your ballot when you mail it back in order for it to be counted. Um, currently, as is, the bill is limited to your voter ID number or your driver's license number, which we know disproportionately impacts people who do not have a driver's license. And currently, there's only one county in the state where you can verify your voter registration number online. So that'll also increase the burden on the counties to field calls in order to advise voters of their voter registration number. We've also seen a bill that has become law that bans the use of private funds in elections. Um, both with respect to administering elections and registering voters. Um, you know, we know that some counties in Arizona utilized private funds in the past election cycle because the legislature didn't appropriate those funds. And it's important that funds are available to election administrators to ensure equal access statewide. Um, those are some of the bills we're currently seeing. And then one of the most concerning bills is a bill that will kick voters off what we call the permanent early voter list, which is a list where you automatically get your ballot by mail. And this will kick voters off the list if they don't vote in two primary and two general elections. There's some debate on the interpretation of the bill, whether those have to be consecutive elections or if you just miss four of those over the course of your lifetime on the permanent early voter list. Um, it's estimated that the, that bill will purge nearly 200,000 voters from the permanent early voter list, which is incredibly concerning. Thank you, Tori. Um, Nancy, let's go to you next. Can you tell us a little bit about Montana's experience with early voting and vote by mail in 2020 and the changes being proposed there? Sure. So uh, the pandemic hit here quite a ways before our primary. Our primary was in June. So our governor uh, made an emergency proclamation that gave the option to all of the county election officials in the state as to whether they wanted to use a, a mail ballot election or have a regular election. And for the primary, all of the counties in Montana opted to go to a mail ballot election. Um, of course, that was the primary. When it came around time for the general, the same order was in place and 11 of the counties opted to have a regular election and not a mail-in election. Um, we had, by sheer numbers, the biggest turnout in both elections that we've ever seen in Montana, and by percentages, the biggest turnout in at least the last 50 years. So um, it, it was a very successful and, again, amazing thing that during COVID we had such a great turnout. Subsequently, there are bills in the legislature. Our legislature in Montana only meets for uh, 90 days every two years. So we've seen a lot of action since January. Um, the other big change in Montana is that for the last 16 years, we've had a mix of uh, who's been in control, which parties have been in control of the House and which parties have been in control of the Senate and the governorship. And now, uh, for the first time in about 16 years, it's all in the control of one party. And so we're seeing a lot of legislation go through um, that, that addresses what people felt were concerns about our successful election in 2020. Uh, and a couple of those bills are right off the top. Uh, we have a bill that completely prohibits the governor from ever changing the election laws in an emergency again, so that that's uh, been taken away. And that bill is almost close to being passed. We have a bill that eliminates same day voter registration. Um, we also have a lot of voters in Montana, Native Americans and others who don't have reliable um, delivery of mail ballots. So we've always had the fallback of being able to always go in on voter on, on election day and be able to register and vote then. 
um, that bill has uh, uh, been transmitted to the governor for signature to eliminate same-day voter registration. Our uh, voter registration will end now on noon on Monday instead of going all the way through Tuesday of Election Day. We have a bill that uh, strengthens, strengthens, adds stringent requirements to our uh, voter ID law, adding a photo ID requirement. And again, um, if you don't have the couple of magical uh, forms of ID, uh, being the state issued driver's license or those more acceptable standard ones, if you have one that's a little off of that, um, you're going to have to provide more proof of who you are than just a photo ID. And you will have to have a photo ID to come in and, and vote, which is not something we have not had in Montana previously. We have uh, another bill that is cleaning up our voter rolls every year now, getting rid of people who perhaps are, are not meeting the requirements for staying on the rolls. It used to be every other year. Um, we have one that's going to shorten the hours for polling places, um, but that's basically not a big change because um, just like Arizona in Montana, over 70% of the folks in Montana vote by absentee ballot already. And so this bill simply goes in and says, let's take those voters into account when we determine how many voters are going to have to be coming in in person in, term, in determining who can close, or, um, they don't have to close early, they can open late is what it is. Um, we also have a bill to, uh, one positive bill that passed is one that helps make more access for disabled voters, cleans up and, and makes it more possible for election officials to share their voting machines for things like school board elections and that sort. And uh, uh, also gets more clear about um, curbside voting and how to have a person help you cast your ballot if you would like to have assistance. The only other thing I comment on in this question is that we also had a bill that would have created more access for Native Americans to be able to get to the polls and, and be able to get ballots as well. And that bill did not get passed. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, that is a lot of activity in a short amount of time. Yeah. Uh, so Caleb, let's turn to you next. Um, since you've been monitoring a lot of legislative activity for CLC across the country, um, if you can give us some examples of things you've seen in other states and maybe a national perspective on uh, proposed legislation in this, in this area. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, unfortunately, many of the things that, you know, Tori described in Arizona and Nancy described in Montana are happening nationwide. Um, so of course, um, the Georgia law included restrictions to early voting, um, shortening the window of early voting for runoff elections um, specifically. And we've just seen all of these, you know, burdensome uh, new requirements for absentee ballots as well. Um, so for example, in Georgia, you would also have to have um, a state issued ID number in order to you know, apply for an absentee ballot, which wasn't the case before. Um, so we've seen several me measures throughout the country, not only in Georgia, but also in Texas um, and in other states, basically meant to target you know, these two areas, early voting and absentee voting, um, which are really two very key things and things that were used primarily by voters in 2020. Um, which, as Nancy mentioned, was a year where we saw record turnout throughout the nation. Um, and so, you know, it seems like the legislators intent is to make sure that there isn't record turnout, uh, unfortunately, the next go around. Yeah, thank you, Caleb. And I'm going to stay with you for the next question. Um, in So not just in 2020, but also in the 2018 election cycle, uh, our team at CLC did a lot of work to help make sure that voters were being provided of notice of any issues with their absentee or mail ballots and the opportunity to correct those errors, uh, commonly called a ballot cure process. Um, so can you talk a little bit about challenges to those notice and cure procedures that, um, you know, that we were able to, to secure for voters in, in 2018 and 2020? Yes, of, of course. So Campaign Legal Center, as you said, was involved in efforts to make sure that states were providing voters with the opportunity to cure any deficiencies um, with their absentee ballots. So Arizona in 2018, and then throughout 2019 and 2020, we were also involved in efforts in New Jersey, in Pennsylvania, and in New York. Uh, when it comes to challenges to these efforts, we specifically saw challenges in Pennsylvania um, by the Trump campaign during the last election after we filed a lawsuit 
um, asking the state to have a process for notifying voters if there are any deficiencies and allowing them to cure uh, those deficiencies. The Trump campaign intervened actually after that, or tried to intervene rather, act after the state agreed with us and said, you know, we really should have a process for this. Um, so the Secretary of State in Pennsylvania issued guidance after our lawsuit to try to help voters be able to, you know, receive notice and cure their ballots. But the Trump campaign tried to step in and basically say, you know, that that process or that uh, notice and cure process for Pennsylvania was not valid. They weren't, you know, ultimately successful in that, but they were unfortunately successful in shortening the period. Um, the Secretary of State had extended the period uh, for Pennsylvania voters to be able to cure their ballots. Um, and they were successful in, you know, shortening that period, but it ultimately didn't have an effect on the election in Pennsylvania. And, and I should say, you know, that curing ballots is something that traditionally both parties um, are, at least in some states like Georgia, understand is an issue and understand that voters should have the opportunity to fix. So for example, in Georgia, out of all the bad that came uh, through that bill, including uh, you know adding these new voter ID requirements, Georgia did uh, remove signature matching from its process because it recognized that you know asking these volunteers to match people's signatures, these volunteers who aren't experts in you know handwriting analysis can lead to some real problems. So although Georgia didn't you know provide what I would call the correct solution to that problem, they did recognize that signature matching can be a problem. Um, and you know hopefully more states understand that you know, not only signature matching, but some of these other deficiencies with the absentee ballot process um, should be cured and voters should have notice and an opportunity to fix them. Thanks, Caleb. Um, Tori, would you like to tell us a little bit about ballot curing procedures and, and issues uh, involving ballot curing in Arizona? Yeah, so currently in Arizona, if you have a mismatch signature, you have five business days after the election to cure that mismatch signature. And two things with curing um, that have been proposed in the legislature, one with respect to the voter ID when voting by mail, that would add another layer of curing process if you didn't include the proper ID, theoretically. Um, two, there's an introduced bill that will limit curing non-existent ballots missing signatures to 7 p.m. on election day. And we know that this will disproportionately hurt Native Americans because the Navajo Nation brought a lawsuit in 2018 to have ballots without signatures treated the same as those with mismatching signatures because Navajo language speakers that did not speak or read English were not given the requisite translation to notify them that they had to sign their ballot. So this bill that will really severely shorten that window of curing for ballots with missing signatures will hurt Native Americans as well as disabled voters who currently can make, you know, a form of a mark, but that may unintentionally be interpreted by the staff as a missing signature. Thank you, Tori. Um, so, Nancy, I want to turn to you next. Um, one of the common threads that we've seen in proposed legislation across the country this year um, and one that Tori mentioned at the beginning of our panel is our bans on private funding and grants uh, for election administration. Can you provide us with an example of how and why private funding is sometimes used in election administration and what impact restrictions like this could have on local elections? Sure. So um, we, we actually had in Montana, we had uh, 29 of our 56 counties actually received grants to help with the election in uh, 2020. And um, this was, it was interesting to me to, to find that out because it'd been very low key. I haven't heard much about it here in Montana. However, we do have a bill in our legislature to prohibit any kind of private funding for elections going forward. So that is a bill that's also had been introduced here in Montana. Um, I had did get in touch with a couple of our election administrators. And I think, you know, for states like Montana, which already had a history of dealing with three quarters of our ballots with absentee ballots in the first place, um, we were already geared up to be able to handle a lot of this. So a lot of what we used our grant money for here in Montana was to tell people about the changes that had been put into place because of COVID. 
um, to advertise to folks to say, you know, your usual polling place won't be open. You'll have to go to the county elections office um, to let people know more about the fact that they were going to be getting a ballot in the mail, which for people who were not uh, absentee ballot people registered for one was news to them. You know, they hadn't been getting ballots in the mail. This was a new thing. So, so my, my understanding from talking with people here in Montana is a lot of the money went into public education and the rest of it went in to augment um, the capacities we already had in place to take care of receiving those ballots, drop boxes, uh, people to watch those drop boxes. I, I, um, we had a, a law in place in Montana that restricted who could bring a ballot back on behalf of someone else. And it was still in effect for the primary. So every single ballot box had to be uh, monitored and you had to fill out a registration form before you could bring your ballot in. Um, I'm happy to say that that law was declared unconstitutional just before the general election, about a month, month and a half before the general election. So we didn't have that complication for the general. But there is a bill that I neglected, neglected to mention in, the, in my first comments. There's a bill in the Montana legislature right now to prohibit anyone who isn't a family member from bringing a ballot back in on behalf of someone else. So um, so that's that's my un understanding of, of what happened here, at least in Montana, is those grants were very essential in getting people the word on how to vote this time around. Um, and the, I think that the most important thing to note about a lot of, of, of local, well, in Montana for sure, elections are all funded by local governments. We don't have any state funding for elections unless it comes through a, a special bill like the COVID money did. And, and for sure, those budgets don't have a whole lot of money for, for public information because they're all geared toward the hardware and the software and the people and all of that sort of stuff. So, so I think that a large share of, 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 of letting people know even how to vote um, came about in part because of this private money in the elections. I did find an article talking about all of this, and uh, I think everybody's in agreement that we shouldn't have to rely on private money to be able to get our elections run the way they should be. But it was a good thing that we had it this time around. Yeah, that's an excellent point, Nancy. And I'll just add that I think in addition to supplementing voter education and information efforts, a lot of those private grants um, that election administrators received this year went uh, in particular to purchasing protective equipment um, to keep poll workers and election officials safe while they were running a nationwide election during the pandemic. Um, and so it's uh, alarming to see legislators uh, blocking those resources from getting to, to local election administration. Um, one of the other topics of election administration legislation that we've seen um, in many states is proposed a legislation that would change the role of secretaries of state or statewide election administrators um, who oversee the election process in most states. Um, so Tori, can you walk us through an example of what proposals like that would mean to voters in the election process and uh, you know, just what, what those changes would entail? Yeah, so um, I imagine in a lot of states, some similar to Arizona, the Secretary of State is a resource to local election administrators and a source to look through for uniformity throughout the state. Um, we know in the Arizona legislature, there have been some bills that have off, that have attempted to alter the Secretary of State's role um, with respect to administering elections in Arizona. Um, actually, the governor just last week vetoed a bill, or potentially this week, I can't remember, but vetoed a bill that would um, empower the Secretary of State to work with the counties in um, administering a voter registration system online. Um, currently, Arizona's voter registration system is through the Motor Vehicles Division, so it limits it to folks who have a driver's license or state ID. Um, so that veto was um, somewhat disappointing. And we know that attempts to alter the Secretary of State's role in setting rules through the elections procedures manual or the process by, with, by which the manual gets approved um, just certainly hurts the ability to create uniformity throughout the state. And, um, you know, I think in many instances, 
shifts or seeks to shift power with respect to elections in various ways. Um, there were some efforts to shift the certification power in the presidential election back to the legislature here. Um, so there's, there's a certain number of alarming threads, but I think it's healthy for each state to have a secretary of state to provide guidance and uniformity to local election administrators. Yeah, and in many states that have you know a statewide executive who oversees election administration, that person is charged uh, by state law with administering those elections in a fair, nonpartisan manner. So when state legislatures, you know, take that authority away from an elections officials and give it to themselves when they're not bound by the same kind of nonpartisan rules, um, you know, that can create uh, some incentives for interference. Um, for partisan gain, which is not something that we want in our election administration. Um, so Caleb, taking the kind of national 30,000 foot view um, and looking at all of these proposed legislative changes across the country, um, there's also there are also federal proposals um, to address some of these uh, election administration issues. So um, I want to talk for a minute about the For the People Act, which is a piece of federal legislation um, that among many other things um, would establish national standards for voting access that would apply to all voters across the country. Um, you know, that bill has been passed in the House and is currently uh, under consideration in the Senate. Um, so if, if that bill were to, were to become law, um, what impact would it have on the legislation that we're seeing pop up uh, in states across the country? Thanks, Jonathan. So HR1, you know, as you said, really sets a national uh, framework and, you know, I'd call it um, a floor for what states can do and can't do. So one thing, for example, that we've been talking about um, is states passing photo ID laws or requiring voters to have either a driver's license or a state issued ID um, in order to vote absentee. HR1 would prevent or ban uh, states from requiring that. Um, under HR 1, as long as voters have a signature um, and are able to sign, uh, then they would be able to apply for an absentee ballot. So they wouldn't need to be someone who is able to or regularly visits um, a DMV office. HR 1 would also make um, no excuse absentee voting the standard. So, you know, several states restrict who can actually vote absentee, um, like Texas, and prevent uh, people who are not either over a certain age or won't be out of their county um, on election day and during the early voting period from even being able to obtain an absentee ballot. So HR1 would prevent those restrictions or remove those restrictions and force every state to at least give voters the option to vote absentee if they want to. Um, HR1 would also um, you know, require two weeks of early voting, including weekend voting. Um, so in states that are trying to shorten their early voting period in a reaction to, 2000, in the, two, to the 2020 election, excuse me, um, HR1 would prevent them uh, from doing that as well. And so HR1 does a, a ton of things um, that would help elections. I know, you know, Nancy also spoke about same day registration. Well, HR1 would require states to offer um, voters the opportunity to register on the day that they show up to the polls. So HR1 includes several proposals that would protect Americans' right to vote. And hopefully it does pass um, going forward so that all of these laws that are either pending or have already passed, you know, are, are gone with the wind. Great, thanks, Caleb. Um, Nancy, we have talked about this a little bit already, but, you know, we hear people from both parties, whether they are candidates or politicians or uh, you know, party operatives talking about access to voting in terms of a partisan advantage. And we hear a lot of discussion about whether new voting restrictions will you know, benefit candidates or voters of one party or another. Um, is it possible for us to change the conversation around access to voting to focus less on the partisan impact and focus more on what would benefit voters and democracy as a whole? Um, and and how would you how would you try to frame this conversation? I, I think it's essential that we try to change this conversation. And um, I have I have have two suggestions on things that can be done. Uh, one of them 
and I don't know that this is possible in all states, but but one of them is to look to the history of of what's happened in your state, and um, and find things that that are 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 things that you have done in the past together that that reinforce democracy that you can bring up again and say you know hey folks republicans and democrats got together and did this in this particular year um let's let's build on that um in montana for example we had a constitutional convention that rewrote our constitution in 1972 and the delegates that came together were a, a very good mix of republicans and democrats and they wrote a document that at the time was considered one of the most progressive constitutions anywhere in Western democracy. And I think to myself, whoa, you know, that is a heritage that we have here that we need to be able to remind people of and to carry forward. And, and it was accomplished with bipartisan support and, and there are the basic rules of how we operate our democracy should be something that we have bipartisan support for. Um, I think the other thing that that it just uh, seems clear to me, and I and I would hope that we can rely on this as well. Is uh, polls show that the average voter out there is more in favor of all of this than the politicians are, and I don't have any examples of it on the voting right issues themselves. But I know that there's um, Pew research and in, in your own research that was done in in the in 2020 uh, talked about how over 70 percent of the people out there who were polled believe that we should have get rid of, of gerrymandering and that we need to uh, put limits on how much money is spent in elections. So, so it seems to me as though the average voter on the street is, is much more committed to wanting to see uh, this partisanship disappear and to be able to have elections and voting rules that, that are fair. I, mean, I think there's a basic principle of fairness that, that people in this country believe in and it's only when you get into the elected politician people who are trying to work the system um for their own advantage i mean that we we have a saying in the league that that um i mean we can see if i can get it straight is that voters should choose their their representatives representatives should not choose their voters and i think that that's a principle that that most voters agree with so so that's some of the ways i would hope that we can 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 get the attention back on what it is the people want and not what it is the politicians want. Thank you, Nancy. Those are great points. And something that, that I should have highlighted when Caleb and I were talking about the For the People Act is that many, if not all, of the proposals in that federal legislation, things like you know, excuse absentee and automatic voter registration, um, are you know hugely popular among voters of all political affiliations. You know, Republican, Democrat, Independent, whatever um, voters in general, um, you know, they like voting and they think that voting should be accessible, um, you know, to to all uh, eligible voters. Um, so, Corey, let's let's turn to you. Um, do you have anything to add to to Nancy's comments about sort of reframing this conversation about voter access uh, to focus more on the voters and democracy and less on on how it will affect a partisan outcomes? Yeah, um, I certainly try to take a people-centric model in that these are rights of individual people. These are rights we hold as citizens. Um, in an ideal democracy, you win by the merit of your ideas and your ability to attract the largest amount of voters. And I think that's what we should be striving towards, not for a model that rewards those that can overcome, you know, a lengthy track of barriers. Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. So if if the folks who are who are listening or watching uh, this panel want to get involved with um, you know, expanding ballot access and, and helping to, to defend the right to vote, um, you know, what can what can they do? Um, you, let's start with Tori and then Nancy um, about your states in particular, and then maybe Caleb can give some more general the so, Tori, want to kick us off? Yeah, um, I personally like the phrase that the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So start um, by identifying your state representatives and let them know your opinion. Um, if your legislature has a public comment portion on these bills that's still going on um, and you have an opinion, 
um, if you can sign up to speak or find a way to register your opinion on these bills. Um, similarly, you know, make your position known with your federal representatives. And then um, there is a very strong chance that there are grassroots organizers in your area that are doing everything they can through social media, through lit drops, through signs, and all these other efforts that you can get involved there. Um, and then I think most importantly, it's important that you serve as a voting resource to your friends, your family, and your community. Um, when these laws go into effect, they always have, uh, there are always waves of kind of voter confusion. And sometimes folks get dropped from the electorate in the shuffle or the change in law um, because, you know, whatever public education campaign wasn't able to reach them in time, be it a voter registration deadline or um, an early voting deadline, a ballot request deadline. So if you can become kind of your resident expert in your family or your community, then you can serve as a resource to people to educate them on their rights and walk them through the process and make sure that they vote. That's great, Nancy. I, I agree with everything Tori said, and, and I would say um, I think all of us need to be going back to the basics and paying more attention to our democracy in general because we've taken it for granted for a long time, and it's at a point right now where we can't take it for granted any longer. Um, I know that, uh, that the, the League is working, for example, with uh, helping uh, with a program with the Girl Scouts to help Girl Scouts understand the fundamentals of what being a citizen is and, and what that means in terms of your responsibilities and your privileges in terms of being involved in, in electing people and being involved in your community. I think um, you know, the, the, the question of democracy to me is not just the ballot box. It's the much larger question of being engaged in your community, of, of being able to engage with people in discussions about things and disagree over what should be done but then to work through and find solutions together. I mean, that to me, I've always thought of democracy as being a hardware and a software kind of analogy. And the hardware is the voting, but the software is the understanding that goes behind that, that yes, we need to compromise. Yes, we need to come together and figure out solutions. And that the best way to do that is by having as many people involved in that discussion as possible. That diversity is what brings us our strength. So, so I think uh, being involved, as Tori said, as an individual is important. I think, yes, grassroots organizations are critical. Of course, the League is a grassroots organization. So I would say, you know, if you're interested in getting involved, I'm sure there's a League somewhere near you that you could join and be part of. Um, the League is also with CLC. Um, I think the other avenue of what can be done is to support organizations who are bringing lawsuits against some of these actions. Um, uh, we, 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 we have to preserve what we can going forward from this uh, direction that things are headed. And in some cases, that's what it takes. And so insofar as people can help support with their dollars, these efforts that are trying to get up education, to try to activate voters, trying to counter with, with lobbying, but then also um, doing it with lawsuits where we have to. I think those are all things that can be done. And uh, wherever you can find a place to plug in, that would be a good place to do it. Thanks, Nancy. Caleb? Yeah, you know, just I would just echo everything that Tori and Nancy said. Um, and I would just add that, you know, remind your elected representatives that they work for you and that it's not the other way around. I think, you know, more than more than we've ever seen right now, politicians kind of, you know, move with impunity, um, like they don't have to face the voters every every time there's an election. So, you know, write, as Tori said, write your elected officials, um, call your elected officials, remind them um, that they represent you. And if they're not moving uh, with your interest in mind, remind them of that. I would also, you know, always suggest being a poll worker um, or volunteering with your state um, or your county or city in any way you can when it comes to election administration. Um, last year, there were thousands or probably millions of Americans who stepped up um, and made sure that our elections ran smoothly. And although, you know, it gets wrapped up in lawsuits and, you know, politician statements at the end of the day, um, our election administration is really rooted 
in those volunteers in all of those communities who show up to the polls for early voting, who show up to count absentee ballots. So if there's any way you can do that as well, you know, I'd say do that. Thanks, Caleb, and thanks, Tori and Nancy. Um, so that concludes uh, sort of our prepared material for today's panel. Um, so we do want to open it up to folks in the audience uh, who are asking questions. I've seen a couple pop up in, in the comment box. Um, so the wonderful Kim, who's working behind the scenes, is going to bump some of those up to the screen so everyone can see. Uh, the first is a question for Tori. Um, do you have a demographic breakdown of voters who are on the Pebble? And as a reminder, the Pebble is the permanent early voting list in Arizona. Um, this regulation uh, see, that we discussed seems like something that would affect elderly and disabled voters disproportionately. Yeah, so we do have a, a Pebble breakdown of who it impacts. Unfortunately, I don't have those numbers on me. Um, but we do know that it'll disproportionately impact voters that uh, don't turn out in those consecutive elections. And so communities that have lower turnout are the ones impacted. I know um, tribal communities here in Arizona have some of the um, lower rates of turnout throughout the state. Um, so we know they will be impacted. And we also know that a group that is by far um, impacted is independent voters. Um, this is because in Arizona, in order to participate in a primary as somebody who is not affiliated with a party, um, you have to do an additional step and reach out to your county and specifically request a partisan ballot, which we know that a lot of voters that don't have a party affiliation don't do. Um, and so because of that, if they don't do that, then that is a strike against them with respect to this Pebble Purge bill. If they miss the general election that year and then the primary and the general in the following year, um, election year, then they're off the Pebble. So those are some of the communities that will be impacted. Thanks, Tori. Um, and just as a reminder to everyone watching, you can submit questions uh, in the comments section uh, on Facebook or YouTube, wherever you are watching. Yeah. Uh, so a question from Tom Hallock, I if I pronounced that right. Uh, in which states are voting rights currently in the greatest jeopardy? Any comments on Pennsylvania or North Carolina? Um, Caleb, why don't we start with you? Yeah, so, you know, starting with Pennsylvania and North Carolina, um, luckily in those states, there's a barrier um, to what the state legislature wants to accomplish um, in Pennsylvania specifically, um, because the state executive or the statewide elected officials um, are not in favor of diminishing the state's uh, voters' voting rights, then you know, even if the state legislature um, tries or does anything to jeopardize those voting rights, there's a barrier in place to prevent them from doing that. Um, other states to watch right now, you know, we're talking about two of them, Arizona and Montana for sure. And then I would just add um, also Texas and Florida are two other states um, that, you know, I would say are in the greatest jeopardy um, for, you know, diminishing voting rights. Another state to watch is Michigan. Um, Michigan is a state that similar to Pennsylvania has that barrier in place where, you know, the statewide election officials aren't necessarily in favor of diminishing voting rights, but the state legislature is. Um, but in Michigan, apparently, uh, there's a pathway for the state legislature to possibly implement, you know, changes or restrictions to voting rights over the governor's veto. So that's yet to happen, um, but it is something to watch out for as well. Yeah, I would just add, you know, as a general matter, I think that the the threat of anti-voter legislation is always going to be more prevalent in a state that has sort of unified state government control by one party, um, because in cases of divided government, um, you're going to have you know, a governor's veto or maybe not not a veto-proof majority in the legislature. Um, so other states that we've been keeping an eye on are places like Iowa and Missouri. Um, that also have unified control by one party and are also uh, either considering or in Iowa's case have already passed uh, legislation that restricts things like early voting and vote by mail. So thank you, Caleb. Moving on to the next one. 
is there a group in my state that is concerned with these issues? Um, I would say there's there are multiple groups in every state that are working on uh, and are concerned about these issues. Uh, I know Nancy mentioned the League of Women Voters, um, which I know has a chapter in Michigan as well as in I think almost every state. Uh, Nancy can correct me if I'm wrong. Every state. Um, yeah, and so there are there are statewide and local groups across the country um, who are working on on these issues. Um, some that CLC works with include groups like All Voting Is Local, which I know has staff in Michigan, um, as well as Arizona. Um, Tor I know Tori and I both work with the All Voting Is Local staff in Arizona quite a bit. Um, groups like Common Cause, um, and so it is. Uh, I don't think it's difficult to find groups of like-minded people in your area who are interested and concerned about these issues and who uh, are working together to you know make their voices heard the legislators and local elected officials uh, to to try and make our our election systems as pro voter as well are we willing to change the filibuster to pass this one uh, S1, for anybody who doesn't know who is watching, is the For the People Act. That's what it has been designated in, in the Senate, Senate, Senate Bill 1. Um, so this is a question that, that we get a lot anytime that we talk about the, the For the People Act or any kind of federal uh, voting reform or legislation. Um, as I'm sure many of the folks watching know, most federal legislation needs 60 votes to overcome a filibuster and be, and be passed into law. Um, and so given the sort of dark partisan divide that has formed around a lot of these issues of voting rights and redistricting and campaign finance reform that are all wrapped into the For the People Act, um, you know, a lot of folks are concerned that the filibuster will remain an obstacle to any meaningful reform on these issues. Um, and so, you know, in response to that, what I would say is that you know, our democracy is in the constitution and the filibuster is not. Uh, and so, you know, any, any Senate procedure or Senate rule that stands in the way of the right to vote um, or, you know, of democracy itself, um, you know, I just, I don't think that that is really a hard call. Um, so I don't know if, if Nancy or Tori have anything that they, that they want to add on this issue. I would just say that the League of Women Voters is of similar mind that the, the democracy depends on people being able to have a majority vote on what goes on and that it's time to get rid of the filibuster. Thank you for that question, DL. A question from Lucy. In New York, the DMV provides photo IDs to non-drivers. The ID looks very similar to a driver's license. Could this be done in states that require a photo ID? Um, I don't know if there are similar non-driver licenses in, in Arizona or Montana that Tori or, or Nancy want to speak to. Uh, I can I can take that. So um, yes, there is. Uh, we just call them state IDs, so they're not associated with driving. Um, but just because they're available doesn't mean they're necessarily accessible. Um, for example, 27% of the land in the state is tribal land, and there is not one motor vehicles division office located on tribal land. So just um, getting from where you live on the reservation to an MVD in order to get the license or the um, state ID can be very burdensome. Yeah, and the same thing is true in Montana. We have huge distances, and and it is a, a major a 60, 70 mile trip one way to just get to an office or an elections office or a DMV to get a, an ID. And yeah, I know think I, some of, oh, go ahead, Kelly. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say that, you know, also there, very often um, there are voters, disproportionately voters of color who don't have the documents that you need to get a voter ID. So um, especially in the South, um, what we see is that often older black voters um, may not have a birth certificate um, because they weren't able to be born in hospitals at the time uh, because of segregation. So, you know, that's just an extra barrier to getting an ID. Um, so it's not just, you know, that voters can't get these uh, IDs. It, it's really the barriers and the restrictions in place to obtaining them. 
And when we're talking about photo ID or voter ID requirements, um, I think it's important to think about how those requirements are structured in each state and you know, what kinds of ID are deemed acceptable by the legislature, um, you know, whether, whether a tribal ID is acceptable or not for the purpose of voting, for example, makes a huge difference to, to voters in tribal communities, uh, whether a student ID um, that is issued by you know, a state-run public university is an acceptable form of ID is something that you wouldn't think is controversial, but you know, in, in some states like Texas, uh, you know, a student ID from the University of Texas with your photo and your and your name on it, um, you know, is is not sufficient for use in voting. And so, um, you know, for circumstances where voters, you know, may not be able to obtain the proper ID, it's also important that states have procedural safeguards um, to allow um, voters to, you know, to prove their identity some other way um, or to otherwise access the ballot even if they can't access the necessary photo ID. As someone who registered to vote using my tribal ID, I echo that sentiment. Um, but also I think it's really important for, uh, in Arizona, we have voter ID for in-person voting and then the proposed voter ID for voting by mail. And I think it's also just really important to make the validity of those ideas uni IDs uniform across the state Currently, my tribal ID is sufficient to vote in person and sufficient to register to vote using a paper form, but it is not accessible. Or it's, it's not able to be used when registering to vote online. And in the current voter ID by mail bill, it has been eliminated as an option. So um, I think it's important to consider the access to the form of ID and then the respect that we give the form of ID in all areas of voting. And not so, just uniformity within a state, but across the state. It shouldn't be that one form of ID works in one state, but it doesn't work in another state. Uh, and sorry, Nancy, I cut you off. I was just going to say that the, the proposed bill in Montana would take student IDs and tribal IDs off the list of being acceptable photo IDs by themselves and require additional ID to be used with those. And the additional ID uh, oftentimes is one that some people want, wouldn't have, a utility bill, a paycheck, or a government document showing their current address. Well, I can see where a lot of seniors, a lot of tribal people, a lot of low income people wouldn't have any of those things and therefore would not be able to, to provide the, the necessary ID to even be able to vote. When I was a college student living in a dorm with a student ID, I don't know how many utility bills I was getting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one more question that came up for us. Um, how does CLC fit into the wide range of voter advocacy groups? Uh, there are there are a growing number of these groups, um, which can be confusing to those of us supporting voting rights. Thank you, thank Mark, for your question. Um, so at CLC, um, our mission is to advance democracy through law um, and to fight for every American's right to participate in the democratic process. Um, so we use kind of the whole toolbox of legal advocacy, whether it's through litigation, policy advocacy, legislative testimony, um, public communications and education, and partnerships with you know, state and local grassroots groups like the League of Women Voters uh, and like the Indian Legal Clinic at ASU um, to win victories you know, at the state house and at the courthouse um, that result in a more transparent and accountable and inclusive democracy. Um, our focus is you know, entirely nonpartisan. We, you know, take on cases and we take positions with respect to voting, you know, without really considering how it affects electoral outcomes. Um, and because what we're focused on are the inputs of democracy, um, not just who can vote, but how and when, um, and making sure that democracy is equally accessible um, and transparent and accountable to to all voters. Um, so. You know, we work a lot in partnership with many other state and national groups. Um, and our long-term goal is really just a, a government that is responsive to, to the people. Um, and so, you know, we achieve that through, through all the means that I just, uh, that I just described um, with a particular nonpartisan focus. I hope that answers your question. So um, we are 
coming up on on the end of our panel. Um, so I do want to give um, all of our panelists a chance to make some closing remarks if they'd like, and then I will wrap us up. And then as a reminder, if you asked a question and we didn't get to it, um, you can send it to us by email. Uh, members of the press send it to media at campaignlegal.org. Um, and members of the public can send it to info at campaignlegal.org. Um, so for closing remarks, um, Caleb, why don't we start with, with you? Yeah, you know, I first just want to thank everyone for, you know, listening to us this afternoon. Um, and, you know, thank you for being attentive to the issues that are currently going on across the states. Um, I just want to reiterate some things that, you know, were, have already been said on this call. If you know, legislation is pending um, in your state, be sure to call your legislators, um, write your legislators. Make sure that they hear your voice and understand that you're not for um, these, you know, burdensome restrictions on voting. Um, I'd also, you know, just echo again from earlier, you know, find a way to get involved, whether that's through a grassroots organization, um, whether that's, you know, as a volunteer, um, either as a poll watcher, as an election worker, um, just continue, you know, fighting the good fight like we're trying to do here at CLC. Um, and, Thank you again for joining us this afternoon. Thanks, Caleb. Uh, Nancy, why don't you go next? Um, you know, it's such a such a huge topic to be able to wrap it up in a few words. It's hard to say, but um, I think fundamentally we need to remember that we need to have faith in each other. That ultimately, it's going to be all of us working together as the people of this country to through our voting and and through our our advocacy and through choosing candidates who stand for what we believe in, that's the way that we're going to be able to make, turn this around. And, and uh, getting big money out of politics, I think is a key to being able to make that system work. So I just go back to, uh, to For the People Act and, and making sure we can get that through. But uh, ultimately with all of that, whatever that may be, it still comes back down to each one of us as voters working together to make our own uh, preferences be what what takes precedent over who, who we vote for and how we move forward. And and that's why we have a democracy. So uh, let's keep the faith is what I guess I'd say. Thanks, Nancy. Tori? Yeah, um, first, I'd just like to thank CLC for having me. And thank you to my other panelists. Um, it's I have such tunnel vision about Arizona. It's always nice every once in a while to <laughs> look up and see what's going on in the rest of the country and um, remind myself that you know we have these shared issues across state lines. Um, I'd also just like to end with a call to action to viewers. Um, make sure your voter registration is up to date. Um, check that your family is registered and their registration is up to date and um, just encourage you to have these conversations with your family about what's going on now. And, you know, the more that we stay active and engaged and educated, hopefully the less people who will, um, you know, be surprised or hurt by the changes in, in law. Because while we focus on the law and its technical interpretation and its impact, um, I can't overstate enough the emotional impact of a voter being turned away from the polls and how it offends their sense of dignity and their sense of belonging in this country. And every election, um, you know, that I've worked on the Arizona Native Vote Election Protection Project, it's happened to somebody and it's heartbreaking and it can impact their entire view of civic engagement. Um, so I think it's important to remind folks in your life that may have had a negative interaction with voting that there is a way to um, potentially work through it and overcome it and stay involved um, through the myriads of means that we discussed today. Thank you, Tori. Um, and to, to those closing remarks, um, I'll just add that there is a quote that I really like from uh, a Supreme Court case from the 1800s that every voting rights legislator or litigator knows by heart because we quote it in every, in every brief I've ever filed. Um, which is that, you know, the right to vote is, you know, our most fundamental right because it is preservative of all of our other rights. Um, and so for those of you who are out there who are concerned about these issues or maybe coming to this for the first time, um, you know, 
become a democracy voter. Make voting rights and democracy your number one issue because without it, you can't make any progress or make any changes on anything else that you care about. Um, so, you know, when you're thinking about candidates, not just at the national or at the federal level, but, you know, many county election officials are elected, um, county boards of elections, um, statewide election officials, um, you know, really consider whether the people who are representing you in your state government and in your federal government are, you know, also supporting democracy. Um, and make that, you know, part of your checklist when you're thinking about, you know, who you're going to put your support behind. Um, and then, of course, you know, echoing everything that Tori and Nancy and Caleb said about getting involved with, um, with your own community, with your family, with your friends, um, and making sure that you are being a resource for, for the people that you interact with. Um, you know, the record-breaking turnout that we saw in 2020 demonstrated you know, to us to work in the space, the overwhelming support uh, for election laws that allow voters to cast their ballots safely and freely. Um, and when it comes to our elections, we want a transparent process that we can trust where uh, every American has equal freedom to vote, whether they live in a small town or a big city, a rural area, the South, the Northeast, the West. Um, so it's the responsibility of our elected officials at the federal, state, and local level to ensure that all of us as Americans have the freedom uh, so if you have additional questions or would like more information about the work that we are doing to secure voting rights for Americans across the country, um, please send us an email at info at campaignlegalcenter.org, um, or you can check out updates on our work at campaignlegal.org. Uh, thank you again for joining us and have a great rest of your afternoon. And thank you to all of our speakers for joining us today.